I think that most persons are interested a little bit in trying to find out the roots of their own individuality. A great many, of course, do not really care. They take life as they know it for, for granted. They do not really ask the meaning of it, or the cause of it, or the consequences of the careers they live. To the great majority, life is accepted as a period of vitality and is concentrated in this structure that we call the human body. So this morning we want to see if we can learn a little about the person or relation between the outer world in which we live and the cause within ourselves. We want to know something about the person abiding in the body. Now we know that man is a very complicated creature. We know also that the dweller in the flesh lives in a very impermanent and almost ineffective physical structure. Very few persons have the energy, the faculties, or the integrations necessary to fulfill their own ambitions or aspirations. They work hard over a period of years and find the body gradually failing them. All of these circumstances do not seem to result in any great study of the matter. It is all sort of taken for granted as part of the passing situations through which we all must pass. Let us then say to ourselves, in this material world in which we live, what part does the human being play in his own existence? I think we must admit that he plays a very important part. All of history, all of society, all of the experiences and discoveries of knowledge are all due to something inside of the human being. Civilization is nothing but a long shadow of something inside of the person. We have something inside of ourselves that built the pyramids, wrote the sacred books, waged all the wars, created all the art, and in addition to these major achievements, perpetuated the species itself with an infinite diversity of individualities. We also find that this being in the body doesn't function the same in all bodies. There is a great individuality here. In the, as a result of that, the living thing in each of us tangles with the living things in others and result in turn in stress, strife, discord, and hatred. How do we understand then the way in which to approach the problem of what is inside of ourselves? Actually, we cannot turn our powers of comprehension inward. We have tried it, and some claim a measure of success. But for the most part, when we turn our conscious attention to the source of our own consciousness, we are stymied. We find that instead of finding answers, we find speculations. Each individual seeking the internal part of himself ends in speculations. He is not able to actually penetrate into the machinery of his own inner life. Having no fortune in this respect, therefore, it is necessary to do what we can. And one of the things we can all do is estimate, to, as far as possible, our own inner lives. We can interpret the conduct of other people, but we seldom correctly interpret our own. We express our attitudes of acceptance or rejections 
to the thoughts of other people, but our own thoughts which more or less drift with, going along with patterns that are often unreasonable, conflicting, contradictory, and may, may in some cases dangerous. So, let's see what would happen if we try to find out a little more about ourselves. I think perhaps Plato, uh, quoted by Philo Judeus, made an interesting statement, namely, that that which goes into the mouth of the individual is material sustenance. But the best that comes out of the mouth in the form of speech can change the course of history. Therefore, nutrition is a private business. Expression vocally is a public concern. Each person, whether he realizes it or not, has a subtle determination to influence other individuals. He wants his own thoughts to be accepted by those around him. Nations expect their policies to be accepted by the rest of the world. Each person, however, is contriving to communicate his own inward feelings about matters and cause these to dominate the lives of other persons. So we have this uh, problem of trying to estimate, if we can, what this power is inside of ourselves. Is it something that is unique to humanity? Do other creatures have this power? Is it something that evolves? Is it something that is bestowed by a power outside of the body itself? Is it a chemistry set up by the integration of the body? Is it largely dependent upon heredity or environment for its moldings? Everyone has at some time or another attempted to answer some of these questions, but for the most part the answers have been conjectures. The actual problem of finding the real answer remains elusive. So we must try in our own way to see if we can find out why we think the way we do, why we believe what we believe, and how from this source within ourselves has emerged a consummate ingenuity by which we have filled the world with an infinite variety of manifestations of one energy power. Actually, we start in by the problem of energy, because whatever is in there is active. It is like a cell or a battery. It has power in there. Now, this power itself maintains all the other functions, and in the body primarily keeps the activity of the heart going through the length of our lives. Well, this energy, however, is not necessarily uh, the source of our opinions. It is rather the source of the machinery which makes opinion possible. It is also rather obvious that we are not completely dominated by heredity. We are not all of us dependent upon our ancestry. Actually, if we look down through history, we will notice that most outstanding and illustrious persons have come from humble backgrounds. And in the turn, their children are comparatively humble. The power of the individual is not conferred upon his descendants, nor did he limit himself, or was he limited, by the comparative inabilities of his ancestry. Each of these units, which we call selves, is tremendously individual. Now, there is, however, a certain problem to bear in mind. We have to try to understand the computerizing processes by means of which the individual gradually becomes an almost universally functioning creature. How is this accomplished? We look at education and we find that it is ineffective. And more and more, there is a complaint from within ourselves 
that the education we are receiving is frustrating the purposes of that which is locked inside of our own natures. Therefore, education is not giving expression to this individuality, but is directing it forcibly into courses which are perhaps inconsistent with its basic patterns and purposes. There is also something else that seems to come out as we go along. There are two levels, apparently, of people. One of these levels is composed of persons who accept and obey the pressures of the environment without question. Whatever is done by others, whatever makes life more simple or convenient for themselves, they follow. Then there is another group, a smaller group, which does not accept these limitations, but strikes out to find expression or to solve problems that challenge the inner life. Now, the only place where the solution to the problem can be is within the individual. But most persons do not become aware of problem-solving powers, except to a very limited degree. So we start looking around, trying to find out how this person, this being in the body, functions. And the first point we come, of course, to, into face-to-face -face contact is that this power, whatever it is, is functioning through a body. It is a body which is a kind of house. And in this house, the being in the body lives or exists or functions. It is not only an occupant, it is a creator. It not only maintains bodies, but it fashions and modifies them. And this being seemingly is forever attempting to move the body structure into harmony with the purposes of the inner life. In other words, what the being in the body wants is that the body will serve its purposes. And the, one of the main problems we have today is a serious complex in this area. In other words, we are now trying to give to the body or to the personality that authority or that consideration which duly belongs to the being in the body. In other words, instead of the body becoming the useful servant of the being, it is now very largely a tyrant or a jailer determining according to its own pleasures how this being is going to function. Under such conditions, we have a lot of conflicts in life, manifesting largely in the fact that individuals forced by circumstances to accept patterns or conditions which are not according to the inner life become frustrated, neurotic, and psychotic. The individual who is unable uh, to use the body for the purpose of the being in the body is always at a disadvantage. Now, the body itself is a reasonably useful structure, but environment, world conditions, and uh, many modifying factors are now greatly disturbing the proper relationships between the functions of the body we find suddenly that this garment, which was supposed to be a useful working vehicle, has become incapable of its original purpose. And uh, beside other circumstances, it has fallen a slave to vanities. It has allowed the person in the body only the privilege to do what the body wants done. Now, the body expresses through its own level of function by what we call appetites. These appetites are pressures in which the body wishes to do as it pleases. One of the major byproducts of these pressures is crime. It is crime either against society or against the body itself. The body punished by the ignorance or perversion of pressure. Uh, is very often sickened and rendered incapable of serving the being in the body. The ancient philosophers working with the problem 
decided that whatever the ultimate life principle is, that this may properly be regarded as deity. That behind the forms, personalities, and instruments, and bodies of nature, there is one eternal life principle. That this eternal life principle is not only a being, but a being which is inherently occupied and dominated by law. In other words, life and law are identical. Each one is a name for the other. Because life, in its own function, follows its own law inevitably. And the moment personal conduct varies from this pattern, there is trouble. In other words, the law or life within us has its own reason for existence. And that reason for existence may not be the same as the personal appetites of the individual. So the philosophers of old like to think of the power in the body as a spirit or a soul or an energizing power within which is the infinite glory of a divine reality. In other words, the power within the individual is limitless and universal because it is the presence of a limitless and universal deity. As deity can do as it pleases. Deity can change anything it wishes to change. But deity, building up bodies, presents us with the mysterious allegory that we find in the opening chapters of Genesis. The purpose for human existence is a gradual revelation of the being in the body through the body until the being in the body is completely the governor of conduct and also gives us the perspectives which provide the incentives for true and eternal growth. Now, if the, uh, the, uh, the uh, philosophers and the old theologians were correct, we have, therefore, within ourselves a mysterious agent that is our share of infinite life. This infinite life in infinite manifestation is also infinitely moving within each human being and is capable of an infinity of manifestations. To understand this, of course, is to be faced with the recognition of the almost Im uh, impotent, the, uh, I want to get the right word for that now. Uh, the infinite opportunity that is locked within the person. The life locked within the life itself is a pressure continually striving into manifestation. And this pressure is constantly meeting resistance. So that gradually the body becomes an impairment. It becomes a restriction and a limiting factor. Now, there are all kinds of circumstances that lead to this condition. And here, perhaps, we have some reason for considering the possibility of heredity. Not that man inherits the inner life, but he does sometimes and may frequently inherit the weaknesses or imperfections of the physical body which belong to his family, his race, or his world at that time. Therefore, the power within is constantly meeting a kind of objection, a pressure from below, a pressure that gradually results in the development of mind as a bridge between the divine and the mortal. Mind is a link. Mind is something that you can educate from below, but must enlighten from above. In other words, the mind can be taught by schooling, by instruction in very many fields. But this instruction is not valuable, actually, unless it contributes to the release of the life factor within the individual. Therefore, education nowadays has become more or less a burden upon the inner life, rather than a means of releasing it. Between the average individual and the releasing of this one divine energy, 
there stands a mass of modifying, conflicting attitudes, reactions, and instructions. The person is not allowed the simple process of searching for the reality in himself. Now, Western philosophy has largely turned towards industrialized materialism. The individual now assumes that the life within himself is primarily concerned in helping him to become rich, powerful, autocratic, and uh, successful in what we would term materialism. If the mind does not contribute to wealth, the individual feels defeated or underprivileged. And if the life in him begins to complain against what he does to uh, gain wealth, then he turns upon himself and regards himself as a victim of theological superstitions. In other words, anything that interferes with his intention becomes a kind of fallacy which he tries to place elsewhere and get rid of in order that he can continue his processes of accumulation. Now we see this very often and very commonly. But to get into the very depth of it, we have to go still further. Actually, in the Orient, there has been a lot of thought given to this problem of the interference of mind and the pressures of materialism with the natural growth of the internal life. The, the only thing about the human being that is important is a partnership between the life within him and the conduct of his own daily existence. Unless he makes this adjustment, he is going to always have a certain amount of conflict. This was the secret of the alchemical philosophy that flourished uh, during the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries in Europe. It was a problem, actually, of transforming the lower into the use value of the higher. In other words, it was the problem of making the soul itself become flesh in and through the body. If the inner life functions normally and naturally in the body and devotes itself to the reason and expression of its own purposes, the individual will have very little difficulty with the problems of living. The old teachers said that the body where it is free from opinion and free from the conflicts of lower emotional and mental attitudes can endure almost indefinitely. And it has even been scientifically recommended that we should hope that in the course of time we will be able to live 150 or 200 years in reasonably good health. The thing that is destroying us is the pressure and conflict between life and ambition, between the energy which sustains us and the misuses of that energy, or the abuses of it, or the corruption of the body so that the energy can no longer function. We will always be in trouble as long as the body is an impairment, as long as it remains as a blocking of the energies of life. It, and when we can have the body serve life, things work very much better. Now, we also, however, inherit into the body when we are born a whole outside environmental picture of things. We are born into a nation, a race, into a, com into a community, into a family. And these pressures move in on us immediately because none of these institutions are really centered in the divine purpose for things. They are all centered in trying to assure survival in this world. But because the survival here is inconsistent with the purposes of the essential life in man, nothing really succeeds. Everything becomes an endless struggle, trying, trying to prevent mistakes from catching up to us. And if they do catch up, that we will find some way of temporarily neutralizing their effects. We therefore grow into a world which is not the one we belong to. 
Uh, we can't go into all the details, but we can point out, for instance, that in the Orient, this has been discovered, has been realized, and it is a known fact, to these people at least, that through quietude and detachment from the causes of death, that the individual is capable of making a creative adjustment with the eternal life within himself. The thing that he has to get rid of is the false appetites and the false decisions made by the mind to so serve the ambitions of the body. Now, the body actually, however, is, is not as bad as we sometimes think it is. It's not really a nasty thing at all. It isn't a wicked thing. It isn't an evil structure. It is something that is simply the instrument of whatever runs it. And if the mind and the emotions become the leaders of the body, they can lead it into destruction. They can destroy its purposes and functions, and in so doing, ultimately, force its separation from the life principle with which it is intimately associated. With one life in the body, moving from its own secret sources, we must realize that there is only one life in society also moving towards its natural results and purposes. And instead of living as we do now, with everyone having their own private world and nations at each other's throats all the time, if we could realize that all nations, all individuals, all planets, and even all cosmic systems are sustained by one energy, this one energy is the common denominator of all that exists. If, therefore, we could once come to serve that energy as it wants to be served, we would end merely all of the conflicts and confusion of mortal existence. But while each individual places himself as a judge of what the inner part of himself decides or demands, he is in trouble. So we still have to start a little bit now and just uh, begin to study ourselves. Now this is a very interesting study and it is not at all necessarily egocentric. It is not that we are studying it in order uh, to gain some kind of glory. What we are trying to do primarily is to study the compound so that we can become capable of living according to the life principle within us. If we are able to do that, most of the secondary difficulties will fade away. So we have to start by finding out a little bit about uh, the habits of our own thinking. In other words, become observant, thoughtful, or aware of our own functions. Now, the bodily problem is not so serious with most people if they can handle the mental and emotional problems. So when you make a decision, try to understand why you've made it. Face the facts of decisions. Why do you want to do a particular thing? What part of your compound does this action serve? And from what level of your consciousness did the impulse to perform this action basically emerge? You can say to yourself usually that the action is one of self-interest of some kind. It's doing what you want to do or trying to avoid what you do not want to do. Now, those two problems of avoidance or fulfillment open a way to understanding ourselves in a much more brilliant manner than any educational system can bestow. In other words, each action, each thought, should be weighed in terms of its relationship to a universal good or a personal uh, self-centeredness. The universal is impersonal. The universal is something in which all parts exist to serve the totality. Individuality is very largely personal, and the more we have of it, the more dangerous it comes to be. So when we find that we avoid a responsibility, or we try to take on a debt that we cannot afford, 
or we say something sharp and unpleasant to a friend or neighbor, or we find no time to take care of children because of our own interests. We should take each of the decisions that we make and follow it along the line of Kant's categorical imperative, which is an excellent way of estimating ourselves. When we make a decision, or when we choose to do a certain thing in the face of choices, we can say to ourselves, if everyone in the world made a decision like mine at this moment, would it be fair, honorable, and constructive to everything that lives? Would I want, in other words, to live in a world ruled over by the decision I'm making on this particular occasion? Would it be fair? Would it be happy for others as well as myself? If I have decided that I don't have time to fulfill a moral responsibility, would my world be happy if nobody had time to do it? Or is it something that others should have time for, but I have other interests? This, is the, this categorical imperative is very, very useful in self-determinations because it indicates the danger of the generalization of a particular. Now, if we uh, overspend ourselves, uh, are we doing that which is according to the best good of our own inner lives and the best good of our society? Or in the effort to overspend ourselves, do we demand uh, more raises of pay and things of this type until inflation moves in and destroys it all? We either have to live according to principles or die for lack of them. And this point is becoming more and more obvious in our daily thinking. So if we say, I want something, can we justify this want in terms of a great good to something besides the fulfillment of our own desires. Now, when it comes to such habits as narcotics and alcoholism, we have other examples to consider. There is no possible way in which the average individual can justify becoming an alcoholic. But it is something he feels that he wants to do at the moment, and it largely involved in shirking responsibility or trying to return to infancy. This type of uh, ailment can destroy the body, and will do so if we do not correct it. But when we destroy the body in this case, we perform a sin against the spirit which is in that body, and which is there to help that body and that person to fulfill its place in life. Alcoholics, alcoholism is a dead end for millions of units of energy. It is a pl an end in which the divine purpose of life itself simply fades out because of the destruction of the physical instrument in which it must function. The only answer then is reincarnation, another body, and also an uncorrected weakness which could well be transferred into the future. So we have to try to prevent this energy, which is the divine power in us, from being so blocked that it results in a world in which there is nothing but sin, crime, and corruption. Everything has to be based upon the use of this energy. Now, if this energy was simply an electrical power that you could put a quarter in the meter and do what you want to with it, it would be different. But this energy is not that kind of an energy. It is what the Greeks call a moral energy. Every use of this energy is a responsibility. This divine power is not for free. You cannot buy it. You must become a useful instrument for it. But it is not something that is yours simply because you're born. And you can do with it as you please. If you take this attitude, you will find very little happiness or comfort in life. You will find yourself drifting further and further into complexities that become so burdensome that you begin to look forward to death as a hope of release. Now, because this energy has a lawful structure, because the soul power in man or the spirit 
or the being in man, whatever you want to refer to it, is a life with a code of conduct. Its use is built in. It is, its purposes are controlled by a law of absolute integrity. Every part of the function of the pure life itself is reasonable, is proper, and is inevitably right. But whenever this power comes into conflict with self-will, then we are reminded of the ancient statement in the Talmud about the self-will. And it is said that that was what destroyed the prehistoric world, and that because of self-will, so fell the angels. The revolt against heaven is the revolt against the proper use of the life principle within yourself. It is the actual uh, revolt against truth, revolt against wisdom, against love against service, against everything that makes things important. And if this rebellion is carried far enough, the individual simply l uses, uh, wrongly or not at all, the energy resources that he has. He therefore gradually passes out of this life without having learned its lessons, and have, not having found any of the joys that come from, in uh, the, from integrity and dedication. So in this particular instance, we have to take it for granted that there must be some way in which this life in us can tell its story. And uh, probably the ancient mystics and the theologians of the remote past who gave us the great religions of the world brought from the inner life of themselves or from space itself something like the Decalogue of Moses that was given by the finger of God in the clouds of Sinai. There have been revelations by means of which the individual has been given the key to his own salvation. We find it in the Ten Commandments. We find it in the teachings of Jesus, in the Buddha, Zoroaster, Hermes, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Pythagoras, all of these great people who were the real teachers of mankind pointed out this inevitable truth that as we are able to control the false pressures of ourselves, we return again to friendship with the divine. We find our own unity with reality by consciously rising above unreality and illusion. Actually, therefore, uh, this problem of getting at this inner core of things is probably through a meditational process. But the meditational process is not valuable unless it is supported by a definite, honorable, conscious dedication. A, a meditation that does not alter conduct is an illusion. The individual who loves God but does not love his fellow man is getting nowhere, regardless of all the platitudes he may think up or all the defenses he may construct for his own action. The law works in a certain way. The law says there are no enemies in my level of consciousness. Therefore, it is not tolerable uh, in the embodied being. Everything that is part of the eternity in us is completely controlled and mathematically structured in an integrity that is incorruptible. So it is not what the law can do to please us, but what we must do in order to keep faith with the law. This is the important consideration. Actually, today, confusion and sorrows and miseries are making deep inroads into our personal attitudes. Probably for the first time in many persons' lifetime, uh, thoughts concerning integrities are coming into focus. We are beginning to realize that something is wrong. And we are also beginning to realize that prayers without works are not going to remedy the situation. And also that all the materialistic compromises that we ever make, industrially, economically, or militarily, will never solve the problem. 
There can never be a war that will bring peace. There never can be a world materialistic civilization that can bring security or happiness to the people of the world. All things finally decide in shifting or result from shifting the level of leadership from the materialistic factors that we now more or less are slave to and restoring our allegiance to that which is without fault or blemish, that which is the integrity of things. In other words, man must find ways of restoring the golden age of integrity in his own world. And that means that he must follow the leadership of life and not the leadership of death. He must gradually and inevitably weed out his own mistakes. Now, we might say that should be a legislation to do this, that they should pass a law and make it obligatory. Uh, unfortunately, this type of law will not be passed because those who most need it are most afraid of it. They are not concerned with making it work. They would be very unhappy if they found that it did work. Because if selfishness can be proven to be a complete failure, we might have a better kind of world to live in. It has proved that it is a failure. But a lot of people are clinging to the hope that they are going to be exceptions to the general condition. That they can do as they please and all will be well, but other people cannot. So here we have the, the problem that we must shift our allegiance. Now, theology attempted to do this, but unfortunately, theology also settled back onto the level of the mind and the personal act, uh, claims of people. This type of law will not be passed because those who most need it are most afraid of it. They are not concerned with making it work. They would be very unhappy if they found that it did work. Because if selfishness can be proven to be a complete failure, we might have a better kind of world to live in. It has proved that it is a failure, but a lot of people are clinging to the hope that they are going to be exceptions to the general condition, that they can do as they please and all will be well, but other people cannot. So here we have the, the problem that we must shift our allegiance. Now, theology attempted to do this, but unfortunately, theology also settled back onto the level of the mind and the personal act, uh, claims of people. What should have been the service of deity became a hierarchy on the theological level, uh, which very largely developed ambitions and uh, power complexes and mistook physical wealth for spiritual integrity. Thus, the uh, theological system didn't work well. But it is true, finally, that this universe is a theocracy. But it is a theocracy in which the supreme power is vested not in a regent, but in the law or truth itself. There is a law that holds atoms together. There is a law that uh, perpetuates the species. There is a law that gives us food and air. There is a law that brings moral life into our families. These rules are the basis of human relationships. When they are obeyed, problems are solved. When they are avoided or corrupted or compromised, problems increase. So sit down sometime by yourself. When you want to do something, when you want to say something, for any act of importance that you make, and try to si find out the level from which it comes. See if you can find in your own actions levels of, act of, of causation that you cannot explain. This may be the very key to the whole matter. If you know where it came from, you may still be in trouble. But if you reach that point, where you know something must be done, but you do not know why. But the determination to do it is the greatest and represents the highest concept of conviction, of integrity that you possess. You're moving in the right direction. So it becomes very important to weed out ulterior motives which disfigure the conduct and character of the person. 
Well, we have in, in this philosophical field that concerns us, we have a whole group of beautiful teachings, wonderful ideas, wonderful and constructive notions. But interwoven among them is a very large amount of self-conceit. Instead of being just a pure faith in realities, these various faiths become competitive institutions trying to take memberships away from each other, which has nothing to do with the fact, because the only organization in which a real membership can exist is in the organization of that being which is within and behind the body. In other words, heaven is the only organization that can survive, because it is the only one which is all-inclusive, and therefore in which there can be no conflict, no jealousies, no competitive careers. Now, as you take this into your own life, if you are concerned with trying to improve your inner life, and I think we all are, certainly we do the best we know how in most cases, but the, the, by sitting down carefully and thinking about what we do, we may be able to raise the whole platform of life one step nearer to the being in the body, something nearer to the universal will of that which is now locked within a cage of particulars. So if you uh, say, I think I should do this or I think I shouldn't do that, Try and find out why. See what level of integrity you're working from. And see if you can find out how to remove from your daily life all or as many as you can of the factors which disfigure the relationship between the being and the body. In other words, everything which is a compromise tightens the prison which locks in the principle of life. If then we say to ourselves, I, uh, I want to be a religious person, and to be a religious person, I want to have spirituality. I want to have insight. I want to have integrities. I want to have the assurance that I'm on my way uh, to cosmic consciousness or something like it. So we uh, then say to ourselves, why do I want this? Why do I want to know more than I know now? And when you start digging into yourself to find the answer to that question, you may find some rather curious circumstances. We may find that under this search for truth, the real fact is ambition. We want to be greater than somebody else. We want to be wiser than somebody else. We want to have influence over other people. We want to gradually expand our knowledge and understanding in the sense that we are going to become members of the higher board of directors and are going to contribute to telling everything else what to do. This type of attitude is there. We see it frequently. We find that the individuals trying to grow puts a barrier in the path of his own growth. He puts the barrier of why he wants to grow. He, he wants to outdistance something, or he wants to avoid something. I know a number of people who have turned to religion, for example, because they were lonely. Well, something can be said. Maybe it was moved them in that direction. But the life they are seeking, the light they are seeking, is something much higher uh, than the fact that they are isolated or semi-isolated in this world. Everything must move to the fulfillment of that which is the infinite reality. And this infinite reality has no pets, it has no favorites, it has no uh, t intention of picking out an ordinary mortal and deifying them for some reason. Everything depends on the motives. If, however, you can go inside of yourself and you can say to yourself honestly and without restriction and without reservation, I want to know more only for one reason, that I can serve others, that I can be more useful, 
Now then, the moment this comes up, however, the secondary egotism steps in, if you're not very careful. Because the process of serving others becomes a form of the fulfillment of an impulse to leadership, which can also get into trouble. We have to try to understand in ourselves why we want to be good. Is it to be comfortable? Is it to be forceful? Is it to improve our material circumstances alone? Or is it because we sincerely want to give full expression to something higher than we've ever known before? If the, incidentally, if the motives are right, and if our dedication is correct, among the byproducts of it will be many of the things that we think we need. We will find that happiness is a byproduct. You cannot make yourself happy. Happiness is the result of so living uh, that the inner life is at peace. This, consequently, is a byproduct, but it has to be earned. The Arabian Nights the Entertainment has the line in it, happiness must be earned. And this is very, very true. And to earn it, we must deserve it. And to deserve it, we must have kept the rules by means of which the integrities of life are protected. Otherwise, we cannot be happy. So it comes to many different uh, attitudes. But we have to also then take a careful look at the other side of the coin. A great many people, feeling that it's necessary uh, to, be, to grow in some way, decide that the best way to grow is to get away from humanity to get off by themselves into some community and live uncontaminated existences. This is another obvious failure. There is nothing to be gained by the individual seeking for peace in order to gain his own comfort and liberation. There can be no real peace uh, without solution. The avoider cannot achieve either. It is only the person who works with the problems, stays out there and fights with it, who can bring about within his own nature a strength great enough to be of useful uh, value to the divine plan of things. We cannot run away from unfinished business and consider that a solution. We cannot believe that virtue is to be attained by hiding oneself from vice. It is not that way at all. Virtue is a consciousness which transcends vice, corrects it, and goes on. Anything that is an evasion or an avoidance means that we are closing a channel by which the life in us is supposed to function. Therefore, a full life means that we grow some mistakes, but we benefit from them. Most people lose almost all the value of a mistake because their first thought is to blame somebody else for it. The individual who makes a bad decision considers that he's been over-influenced. The only reason why a person is over-influenced, really, is because they haven't got the inner life light to influence themselves correctly. So that there is no gain if we transfer the guilt for our misfortunes to society or to other persons or to situations that arise in our environment. The individual must accept full responsibility. The moment he can evade himself out of a problem, its, its value as a spiritual experience is lost. And we nearly always do it. I, I think it's one of the most common problems in the world. One, of course, of the reasons for it is that we may accept a level of advice which is inadequate. If we follow persons who do not know, then we are in trouble. And if we try to find uh, answers to our own shortcomings uh, from sources which are inadequate and are not intelligently dominated, we can't get very far. Now, one of these things I think we also have to realize is that a useless life is a, a waste of divine energy. 
A useless life is like turning all the lights in the house on and then going away and leaving them on. A useless life is energy expended for no reason. A useless life is waste. And it's often involved in extravagance because the useless individual tries to buy usefulness, tries to find some kind of false entertainment or false uh, pleasures which are usually expensive. Therefore, it is very, very important for the individual to maintain a proper usefulness with life. Every day should be uh, loaded with lessons of some kind. The individual should be better at the end of every day. He should be a little nearer to obeying the law, because all the experiences of his outside living reveal laws every time he turns around. He is constantly in the midst of a network of realities, which he rejects or ignores or tries to misinterpret. So the individual who has this energy within him is not doing it well if he wastes it. And wastes it means to do things that are not useful, not helpful, not purposeful, and not in harmony with truth. Uselessness is to fill empty time to try to be as comfortable as possible till death comes. It is just sitting around doing foolish things and assuming that this is living. As long as a person has the breath of life in themselves, they can labor and learn. They can do something that is significant to the unfoldment of their own inner lives. To waste time is in a sense a sin against God, because time is an et, a period set aside for use. And when we waste it, we waste the life power that should have motivated it. And when we use the spiritual energies of life for some trite and useless activity, we are simply failing in the large emergencies of things. So with the Greeks and the Oriental people also, there comes this problem of trying to get into the inside of our own questions and our own problems. Pythagoras advocated a discipline of retrospection for this purpose. He taught that his disciples and everyone who believed in truth should at the end of every day make a very careful analysis of that day and its happenings usually in reverse order, so that in the problem of, re, of meditating or of working with this retrospective exercise, the individual begins with the effect in that day and goes back to the cause. Instead of seeing the causes produce their effects, he sees effects and in that way becomes gradually aware of causes. This is the more important way, according to the Greek consciousness because it's the effect that we face every day, and it is the cause of the effect that we ignore. So in retrospective exercise, the person takes a good long look at himself. He realizes that he is the pen in the hand of a ready writer. He realizes that he has resources which are intended to perfect him and fulfill him so that he can go on into higher orders of evolutionary existence that he therefore should uh, study, meditate upon his own conduct. If he finds that he has made a mistake that is correctable, he should correct it. Sometimes a mistake can be corrected if you find it out within a few hours. If you wait for 20 years, it very often cannot be corrected. So you start in and you say, well, I was annoyed, I got angry. I, uh, I said something very unkind to my child this afternoon. Why? Because I was annoyed. Why was I annoyed? Because well, someone bothered me when I didn't want to be bothered. And so you trace on back until you find out the cause of the annoyance. You look yourself straight in the face and say, that was pretty foolish. You finally dis discover that your daily life is a mass of unrelated incidents that are comparatively meaningless. And by the time night comes, you're worn out with your own mistakes. <laughs> this isn't necessary. 
it is perfectly possible for the individual, by carefully watching a day's activity, to find out what he neglected, what he did that was wrong, what he spent that he shouldn't have spent, the kind words he should have spoken but didn't, unkind words that he should not have spoken but did. All these things in a, a nice, quiet retrospection over a period of 20 or 30 minutes at the end of a day will help the individual to find out how he really lived. And the, an interesting point about that is this process of retrospection, what is behind it? What would make us do this? Why would we want to know something more about ourselves? Why should we want to correct some mistake? The answer gradually becomes apparent as we do the retrospection, namely that wherever we did that which was not right, the consequences were bad. Whatever we misrepresented hurt us. Whatever we neglected left us less reliant. We became less and less thoughtful because we made no effort to determine the consequences of our own conduct. All of this gradually releases into us a realization of something, namely that there is nothing in this world that we can think, feel, or do that does not have consequences. And these consequences are part of the law, and they relate to the being in the body. It is not the mind that punishes us. It is life that punishes us. It is not the emotion that destroys us because we have misused it. It is because the energy in the emotion was ruled by universal law and we broke the rule. Behind everything is an eternal flow of quiet, smooth life. And wherever it becomes choppy, it's because of something we do. Now, we may say that we like that kind of variety. We'd rather make a few mistakes because it's interesting. But unfortunately, these interesting mistakes gradually undermine character. We cannot tolerate them. But uh, the answer, of course, is to find something that is more interesting, something that is more happy than the mistakes that we have been depending upon for variety. It is not necessary for the individual get to become angry simply because he possesses the potential of anger. It is perfectly possible to use this energy better. And fate and fortune, and to that matter, compensation, punishment, all are related to the use and abuse of the divine energy upon which all things depend. The moment we abuse life, life becomes unhappy. It becomes unpleasant, not because life itself is pointing a finger at us, not because some evil spirit is causing us t troubles, but because inherent in life is a power. And this power, if frustrated or misused or abused, will turn upon us and will gradually continue to turn upon us until at last we are forced into line with the integrities. One way, of course, to help to get the thing into a little better condition is to make sure that every day of our living, as far as possible, is in itself an interesting experience. We should have interests. We should have things to think about which keep our minds from negative attitudes. We should have a busy mental and emotional life that is constructive, that is doing things to add to our, our value as human beings. Art, music, all of these kinds of arts help to ennoble emotions and help to take us away from the allowing emotions to simply stew inside of ourselves until they break out as a temper fit. All of the creative things of life are available to us because law is not only a preserver of all things, but it is the creator of all things. The universal law is creative. It is eternal in its unfoldment, and it is constantly so structured that it will reveal more and more of itself to those who make proper use of its resources. So it's a very good idea for the individual to be economical about things. We can't help but feel that there's a great deal of wastefulness in modern living. Most of the things that we do uh, for pleasure cannot be justified. 
They mean absolutely nothing. They add to nothing. Many of them are very expensive, and then they, when they're all through, there's not much left but a headache. So therefore, one of the important things and that, helps us to that will help us to live properly is to control and direct activities. We can do things for less money, probably, that are far more interesting than many of the so-called pleasures which we now indulge often excessively. Everything that works together for life and for value gradually builds up a tremendous sense of worthwhileness, a sense of doing something that is of significance to other people and of value to ourselves. So the retrospective exercise is a very good uh, exercise for those who want to get into a little closer relationship with themselves. On the other hand also, you have a form of concentrative exercise that Pythagoras also advocated. He and his disciples went out at dawn and offered the day to the life which had created it. They planned the day with not a heavy burden of responsibilities, but with a sense of significance. They took into account all the things that we have to do with the day, and that we don't have all this time to do anything we want to. But one of the things that we must try to preserve is enough energy and time to make some useful contribution every day to something, to some value within ourselves. Perhaps we can make this contribution in the job itself where we work. Just a little more sincerity in the work, just a little more willingness and desire to earn the paycheck, just to be a little bit more careful and cautious and economical in the various functions of our daily life, a little more thoughtful of family, a little more thoughtful of all the problems that come along by planning the day in advance and planning it before occasions demand, and then staying with the plan and standing firm against the occasions that disqualify it, gradually we gain control over what we're going to do next, rather than trying to figure out how to get over what we've already done. So little by little, we gain a homogeneity, an integrity, a consistency, and a wonderfulness, a a, a purposed life. Now, absolutely no one can be really happy who is bored. And nearly everyone is bored who isn't doing something useful. Boredom is nearly always associated with excess and corruptions of one kind or another. We try to do something to forget the fact that we're not doing anything. So in these things, you start looking inside yourself. And you try to measure out and say, I have an allotment. I have so much energy every day. I pay for this energy by the fact that I use it, and as I use it, I live in a limited amount of time. Therefore, I can only use this particular form of energy in this particular way while I am embodied in this world. Therefore, I want to make the most of this energy. I want it to help to build a better world. I want to find the pleasure in myself that comes from being useful rather than ornamental. I want to do things that make meaning. And also, I do not want to support extravagance. I do not want to uh, dissipate or do these things which have no value to the life within us. Perhaps the, one of the simplest ways the old Christian mystic always uh, uh, use the symbol of Christ knocking at the door. This universal power in us we can term the only begotten of the Father. It is the life itself, and it as a force that is forever knocking at our door. It is knocking through the medium of the heart and through the love and thoughtfulness and wisdom that comes from dedication to principles. And every day we live, this divine power is seeking to come through us. 
It wants to express itself in the creature which it has fashioned, for man is the noblest and most completely integrated form of life that we know. Man has the greatest potential. He has the greatest power to be, to do, to use the divine energies. He can actually help to restore the world which his ancestors destroyed. He can bring about now the conditions uh, which will advance the destiny of descendants and help to leave a better world behind him. But between him and this achievement is always the arrogance, the ambition, and the self-centeredness, the selfishness that comes from his desperate effort to become important in the material world. We should have learned before this that it doesn't make any difference whether you're the most humble person in all the world or whether you are one of the world's great dictators, you're going to go to sleep in the same earth. Therefore, this idea of trying to own the world is a fallacy, for no one can own more than the amount it takes for his own body. And the rest is ambition, arrogance, and superstition. So we try to do something as we go along to release and venerate this life in ourselves. We want to think of our bodies as temples, as sanctuaries of a divine power. Whether we're rich or poor, whether the humblest of all native primitive people or the most highly evolved that we can imagine, we are all living houses of worship for the life that is within us. And in this life, in this temple, is the heart which is the high altar. And here it is that the divine spirit abides with us. Our body is a living house of a living God. It is a place of worship. It is a place to, be, to dedicate to life. And each one, in the course of time, through the maturing of his own inner life, becomes an apostle of the life in the heart. He receives ordination, and every human being is potentially a minister of the Lord, a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, Prince of Salem. Every part of us is finally going to become a servant dedicated to the eternal in ourselves. Until this happens, problems will not end. Until this happens, the values of our lives will be uncertain. But it is very important to begin to think about it and try it little by little to live according to this eternal power rather than to live according to the temporal attitudes and opinions of our own natures. It is very, very valuable to even make a little start and say to ourselves, today I will not waste that time again. Today I will not become an alcoholic. Today I will not uh, increase my miseries and sufferings through perversities of mind, emotion, or body. I will not worry over that which cannot be changed. I will endure with patience that which is necessary. And I will find in the end that by accepting these problems rather than fighting them, I come through the end of the day with much more energy that can be devoted to better things. After all, this is really, in a sense, the mystery of the Eucharist. This is the mystery of the Last Supper. For this divine energy feeds us all. It is the source of every moment of our existence. It is not only the energy in ourselves that feeds us, we are also fed by the energy in other things that sacrifice themselves for our good. The energy in the wheat, in the flour, in all the different fruits and vegetables. The energies in all things become part of a power to restore our own material existence. And this vitality that we talk about with vitamins and all that, this is simply the same divine energy on a lower level of function. That part of energy which is completely related to body is understood in the form of nutrition. It prevents us from losing our lives for lack of food. 
and the alchemy of digestion and transformation within ourselves is nature's supreme mystery as far as physical matters are concerned. And therefore we have a kind of Eucharist here, one energy feeding all things, one life living in all things, and one life dedicating all these other lives, like the disciples at the Eucharist, to go forth and spread the gospel, to go and heal the sick, and comfort the sorrowful, and all these different things, and raise the dead. And in raising the dead, raise the individual who is completely locked in his materialism, for though he may be walking around, he is still dead. He is dead until life lifts him up into purpose. Until he has a purpose, he is not alive. And that one purpose must never be self-interest, because that makes him more and more a kind of antichrist. It makes him more and more away from the great flow of life. We are all living by the shores of the river of life, and we are all dependent upon it. And the answer to it is that this river of life is our God. It is the spirit of all things in the innermost and the furthermost. It is the spirit in the tiniest moat floating in the sunbeam. It is the spirit in the vast galaxy which exists in space. All these things are moved by one energy, one life. And all these things survive because they obey the laws of that energy. And man, as Aquinas has pointed out, having a certain limited, limited, uh, in a, a limited ability to function according to his own mind, determinism, he is capable of the mistaken decision. Because he has the right to choose, he may choose that which is best or that which is not best. But by the choice, he is, in, he is disciplined. The reason man must make a choice himself is because he is not a creature that is a slave to anything. His final enlightenment comes through self-determination. By choosing that which is right, he becomes right. And by, using, and by becoming right, he uses the energies of, this, of space to preserve that which is right for himself and others. Now we are in the shadow of very heavy times at this moment, and they're very discouraging to many people. But we have to realize that this great life, which is moving through everything, has its own rules and can never fail. Ultimately, this life will bring all things home to itself again. It will prove out over infinities of time that the lessons that are necessary must be accepted. But by accepting the lessons, either by choice or necessity, we are growing toward that which is our own inevitable destiny, the destiny to fulfill the divine plan, the destiny to realize that we too are divine beings capable of determining right and wrong, capable of living according to law or according to the bodily pressures of environment. We can win the fight, but we can win a little every day. And every day when we make the smallest victory, there will be a little more of happiness and a little less of pain. Every day, one step forward, even a small decision, will strengthen us for another one tomorrow. And gradually these right decisions will bring us enlightenment and companionship in the spiritual adventure of existence. These are the things that are important, and we hope that everyone will give a little special thought to them in his own way. Well, I guess that's all we can do right now, but I've got a couple of announcements to make that I think are important. This afternoon, we are having a memorial service at 1 o'clock for Leon Edwin Case. He has been with our organization for many, many years and uh, has been a very fine and wonderful person and was one of the founders, apparently, of a group here, a Foot Reflexology Awareness Association. And he has, has quite a group around him, or had it, and uh, was a great inspiration to many people and a very good friend of ours. So at one o'clock this afternoon, there will be a, a memorial service 
for Mr. Case here and the members of the uh, Foot Reflexology Association are providing the refreshments so that uh, today we will not have our refreshments. They all will be by courtesy of this organization in memory of Mr. Case. But it means, however, that you will have to make a great decision of integrity and unselfishness because you will have to wait for the refreshments until after the memorial service is over. Thank you very much.